Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Where we are in this drama as it unfolds is is we're with our Lord now in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been spending time with his disciples, preparing them for his impending death. As much as you can prepare someone who loves you for your death. He's told them he's going away and they're confused and distressed by that. He's warned them that, well, things are going to get tough, fellas, and you're all going to forsake me. Well, that about sums it up. In his message entitled Arrested and Denied, we're looking at the events surrounding Jesus' arrest, his trial before the Jews, and Peter's denial. So let's jump into Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. One of the great joys of this particular season, especially this time around for me, is it just turned out that as we've worked our way through Matthew, that that we, well, Lord willing, if things continue as they've been going, on Resurrection Sunday, we will be in Matthew 28. Now that's wonderful in and of itself, since we didn't pre-plan it. But, but there's something else that's even better. By the way, Matthew 28 just happens to be on the resurrection. So that works out rather well. But that's not so much what excites me. What excites me is how many of us are getting to study through all of the events leading up to the resurrection in these weeks prior to the resurrection. Why? Because, well, over the years, I've, I've had numerous people who've come up and they're like, Pastor, you're in a real rut. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And they're like, every time I come here, you talk about the same thing. And I'm like, well, how often do you come? And they're like, twice a year, every Christmas, every Easter. It's always Jesus got born and Jesus got resurrected. Don't you teach anything else? Well, yeah, I got 50 other Sundays, you see. And, and, and though I joke about it, it, it's true for many of us even, though you may be regular at church, you may have never studied in its context the events that lead up to the death and resurrection of our Lord. And listen, it's so much more meaningful when you've got the whole picture, when you, when you see it from, from front to back, from beginning to end. Well, where we are in this drama as it unfolds is, is we're with our Lord now in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been spending time with his disciples, preparing them for his impending death, as much as you can prepare someone who loves you for your death. He's told them he's going away and they're confused and distressed by that. He's warned them that, well, things are going to get tough, fellas, and you're all going to forsake me. And well, one of you is going to betray me. And then Peter says, well, I'll never forsake you. And he says, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. And in the midst of all of that, well, just last Wednesday night, we looked at Jesus' words, let not your heart be troubled. Oh, he knew that they were struggling. He knew they were suffering. He knew they were troubled. And so he encourages them and he would encourage us, listen, even as they failed him, we'll fail him. Even as they faltered and sinned, that's, it's inherent. We will falter and sin. We're not using that as an excuse. It's just a reality, a tragic reality, but, but nevertheless a reality. And we need to know the Lord's heart toward us when we falter, when we fail, because the enemy comes in and says, man, you, you know, it was one thing when you didn't know, but now you do know. And you think the Lord, well, of course the Lord forgives you. He, he chose you to transform and use you, and he knew you would fail. You're only finding out the truth about yourself, and he always knew well, we have this wonderful example then of how our Lord deals with his disciples. And then we have, well, some not so great of examples as how the disciples dealt. Well, we can learn from both. Jesus, by the way, verse 36, it says, came with them to a place called Gethsemane. The word means oil press. It's where the olives would be crushed and the oil would spill out. Interesting that in Isaiah 53, and those of you who've seen The Passion, you know that they pop that up at the very beginning of the movie. And it says, not as my Bible says, wounded for our transgressions, but quoting a different version, crushed for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquities. You know, it's powerful imagery. And and so what happens is he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a private garden. He had access to it. He went there. And by the way, if you go to Israel ever, you get opportunity. We've been there many times and tend to start going again as soon as it seems practical. And 
The Garden of Gethsemane is right across from the eastern gate of the city. And so Jesus would have gone out and ascended that little hill and gone into that garden. And, and he goes there, says to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus takes his inner circle, that, that same group, Peter, James, and John, who had been there with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and he takes them aside and he takes them further in, and then he says, Stay here, watch, pray. Jesus was going through the greatest time of suffering and temptation well, that he had experienced since our earlier studies, much earlier in, in Matthew 4. If you look at the temptation of Jesus early on, you know it says that the enemy departed until a more opportune season. I believe this to be that season. The real battle was taking place there in, in his prayer time with the Father. The, the real battle, the real victory was won in his time of prayer. And there's some practical things we're going to glean from this. But notice his, his heart and his mindset. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Having gone a little farther, he asked, Father, the words powerful, oh my Father. In the original, it's Abba, Father. Now, no religious leader would have ever spoken to the Father in those terms. It's far too intimate. See, when they prayed, it's like, Oh, God, creator of all things, sustainer. And, and they'd use all these glorious and wonderful adjectives to describe God. And as wonderful as that is, it distanced them from God. But when Jesus prays to the Father... He says, literally, Daddy. This is the word that a young child would use to relate to his father. And Jesus and Jesus alone in Scripture ever spoke to the Father that way. But get this, he authorizes us to do the same. He tells us we can now approach and call him Abba, Daddy. And, and the picture is the intimacy that Almighty God is powerful and radical as he is. He desires that close personal, intimate relationship with us. And so, oh, my Father, Abba, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There are really three lines of thought that we have to deal with in this one verse. And first of all, if it's possible, let this cup pass. What is Jesus asking? If it is possible for mankind to be saved, made right with you, if it's there's any other way, let's not go this way. If there's a plan B, let's pass on plan A. And if, in fact, there were some act that I could perform or some affirmation I could make or, or some affiliation that, well, it's not there, you see. There's no hope for a right relationship with the Father, for reconciliation to the Father apart from the finished work of Jesus. We know that because he prays three times. If there's any other way, let this cup pass. The second thing we have to consider is the cup itself. It wasn't just a cup of physical suffering, though if, again, you've seen the passion, you know the intense physical suffering our Lord endured. Some have asked of that movie, was it necessary to make it so gory? Was it necessary to make it so intense? Listen, I'm certain that what we see in that movie doesn't even give us the full extent of what went on physically. But Jesus' suffering wasn't just physical. But know this, though he was fully God, he was fully man. And, and as a man, he would, as we would... Say, look, at, I don't want to suffer like that if there's any other possibility. I don't want to go through that if there's any other way. But it wasn't just physical suffering. There was shame involved in it. Why? The cross was a criminal's death. Only guilty and the worst of the guilty got crucified in that situation, in that generation. And so, so Jesus is saying not, not just the physical pain and not just the, the social shame, but I believe that the most serious thing that he is shrinking back from and, and seeking to avoid, if at all possible, would be the spiritual effect that he would be going through something, experiencing something he had never, ever experienced in his entire 
Well, existence. And by the way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was always with the Father, in perfect fellowship with the Father, face to face with the Father. That's the picture that's given to us there in the beginning of John's Gospel. Jesus had always been. And, and so you know or should know, if you're unaware, that at the cross, your sins, my sins, were placed on Jesus. It was common in those days, during that time of scourging, that criminals would cry out sins they'd committed. They would confess crimes they'd committed. Well, that, that helped solve a lot of, well, mysteries and, well, who did this and who did this? But, of course, Jesus never cried out anything because he had no crimes, no sins to confess. He experienced the full brunt of that torment and torture. And then they nailed him to a cross. And he knew that the worst of all of it, more than the physical, more than the mental, would, would be the spiritual impact of having our sins placed on him. And here's what happens. For the first and then the only time in all of his fellowship and relationship with the Father, Jesus sent something that, well, we're not all that sensitive to, but if we really we really experience the kind of fellowship God intends, it would horrify us. You see, sin causes separation. The wages of sin is death. We read that and we're like, yeah, people die. It's not just physical death. It's a spiritual reality. You know this in your marriage as if in fact you're married. Sin causes separation. And the moment a father sins against his child or a husband against his wife or a wife against his, her husband, you know there's a separation. And if you don't repent readily, immediately, that separation grows greater and greater and greater. That gulf grows wider and wider and wider. And so Jesus, well, he'd never been separated from the Father. He'd never had anything to distance him from the Father. He says, I do always those things that please the Father. Tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Now, there's sort of a divine mystery that... And we'll talk about it again when we get to the cross, but I want to lay a foundation for it. There's a divine mystery that really is beyond us. Because you can never be closer to the Father than when you're in complete and total obedience to Him, absolute submission to His will. And so, if at the moment Jesus took your sins and my sins upon Himself... He was doing that in obedience to the Father, which of course he is. If there's any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, and that's the third part, not my will, but yours be done. No, Jesus was pleasing the Father. He, he was obeying the Father. He was blessing the Father, even at the moment our sins were placed on him. So he could never be closer to the Father than at that moment. And yet at that moment, he sent something that as I shared, we should sense and often fail to, and that would be separation from the Father. Now, some have suggested the Father turns away from the Son. I'm not sure that that's accurate scripturally, and here's why. What happens when you sin against God? Does He run from you, turn His back on you, deny you? No, not at all. He pursues you. He comes after you. He convicts you. And conviction, if things go right, it leads to confession and then confession to cleansing and cleansing to restoration. It wasn't so much the father turning from the son. It's that the son sensed this sin, though it wasn't even his sin. It is causing a separation. How real is that separation? Listen, only Jesus could tell us. But I do know this. Your sin and my sin causes a real separation from our father. It causes a separation in our relationships to one another. In unrepentant sin, man, it devastates, it defiles, it, it renders us unfit for service, for worship, for fellowship. So, listen, since you're going to sin, you have and you will, and since I'm going to sin, I have and I will, and we'll see that so clearly in these first disciples' example, it's essential that we understand the moment I've sinned, and the moment I'm convicted of sin, I need to confess and repent. I don't want to let there be one minute go by or five minutes or five hours or five days because, listen, that can turn into five weeks and five months. And I'm sure many of us here have people in our lives. And we can think about, you know, look back on times where something happened. We were alienated from someone because of something that happened. And, and that distance has grown 
wider and wider and wider, that gulf wider and wider, till, till there's no relationship at all. That's what sin does. And Jesus was sensing that alienation. He was sensing that separation from the Father. And I believe more than anything else, that's what he was shrinking back from, that spiritual reality. So he says, listen, my soul's exceedingly sorrowful. sorrowful. Stay and watch with me. Father, if this cup can pass, let it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We go back to our first point in all that. If it were possible for you to be forgiven, saved, adopted, born again, if in fact it were possible for you to be reconciled and restored to a right relationship with the Father, any other way, don't misunderstand this, then Jesus would have died, well, at least in relationship to you in vain. By the way, even if... Even if... No one responded to Jesus' offer of forgiveness. Jesus would have still gone to the cross. It wasn't just about you. It was something between him and the Father. It was was him making provision. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy set before him? First of all, just that the Father would, would say, well done, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then secondly, that we could be with him in heaven, in glory, on earth, for eternity, wherever he is, we will be. Well, he comes to the disciples, verse 40, and found them asleep, and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, he singles Peter out, and we've been kind of hard on Peter. There are reasons for that. We relate to him, you know. It's, he was a guy that always was affirming, hey, they may flake, I'll never flake. They falter, I'll never falter. I'll be there for you. You can trust in me. You can count on me. And there are some of us that really can relate. We, we look at other people and we think, yeah, I get most people are spiritual wimps, but Lord, that's not me. And the thing is, if you, like Peter, really believe in your heart that you're so much further along than the rest, man, you're headed for a fall. And when Peter affirmed that he would never deny the Lord, he would never forsake the Lord, listen, he says, you're going to not only forsake me, you'll deny me three times. Now, I have to admit to you, I am humbled and even ashamed as I read verse 40, not of Peter, but of me, because You see, I, like Peter, I'm the kind that would say, Lord, I'll die for you. Whatever it takes, I'll lay down my life. I'll forsake all. I'll do whatever. But when it gets right down to it, the Lord comes and says, can't you stay awake for an hour in prayer? Or can't you be alert with me? Can't you watch with me? And yes, the context is a little different here because Jesus was actually seeking human comfort. Though he had perfect fellowship with the Father, though an angel came and ministered to him, if you read through the other gospel accounts, he wanted the comfort of his closest friends during this time of trial and, and well, suffering. And, and so he comes and he says to Peter, why? Because Peter was the one saying, I'm more than they are, I'm better than they are. And he says, why couldn't you watch with me one hour? Now note, the failure to watch, as Jesus had instructed, the failure to pray, the failure to be sensitive spiritually is going to lead Peter into all sorts of problems in a moment. And I'd suggest the same thing happens to each and every one of us. Jesus forewarns us and we're like, yeah, boy, that, that is a powerful warning, Lord. I'm sure that applies to somebody. And he's like, Money. no, it applies to you, 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 the, you're here. You, I know this happens to you. You hear something, you think, oh, if only my wife would have heard that, or if only so-and-so could hear that. Well, maybe they really need to, but I'm fully convinced that you need to hear it because you're here. God's drawn you. Could have been a lot of places this morning, but you're here. And so to Peter, he says, and to the others, and to us, I believe, watch and pray, verse 41, lest you enter in to temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is Jesus excusing their sin? No. And he doesn't excuse ours. But what he's saying is, I do understand. I know what it is to be in the flesh. I've been in the skin, you see. And he's just saying, hey, the flesh is weak. But he went away a second time and prayed, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep. And again, for their eyes were heavy, and and he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Don't miss that. Three times he asked if there's any other way, if there's a plan B, let's go that way, Father. 
That tells me again, there's no other way. Jesus didn't just claim to be the way. He, he is the way, the truth, and the life. You will never get to the Father but through him. You will never get to heaven but by him. So he left them. He went away, prayed the third time. And as he comes, he says, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. See, he who betrays me is at hand. Now these guys, and get the picture, They've had a really tough, long day, and, and, and now there have been a lot of things. Jesus has taken them to dinner. He's washed their feet. He's told them they're gonna, one's going to betray him. They're all going to forsake him. Peter's going to deny him. He goes on to say, let not your heart be troubled. And all that's going through their minds. They find their way into the garden. It's quiet. It's peaceful. And they nod off. And he comes and he wakes them up, and then they nod off again. And he, well, he comes and they're sleeping yet again. And they wake from that sleep to a radical scene. This had happened once before, at least that we're aware of, to Peter, James, and John. They were there in the Mount of Transfiguration. They nodded off that time too. And when they woke up, Peter's like, oh, wow, this is radical. Look, it's Elijah and Moses. And he goes, he, just blurting out, you know, he's not even, his head's not even clear. And he's like, let's build some booths. Let's establish the kingdom in essence right here and now. And, and you know the story. A cloud appears out of nowhere and the father speaks from a cloud. Peter, shut up. <laughs> This is my beloved son. Hear him. Well, I threw the shut up in, but and I know God doesn't say shut up. But it's, it's there, you see, inherent in the message. Well, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, verse 47, with the great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. A great multitude. One of the Gospels tells us it was a cohort. A cohort. That's 600 soldiers. Keep that in mind. It's important. 600 soldiers. And his betrayer had given them a sign. Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And immediately went to Jesus saying, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. This reminds us, of course, that though Jesus had been ministering in that vicinity often, and though he'd been, well, ministering around for three and a half years publicly, there wasn't anything outwardly that would have said, oh yeah, that's the one. They needed to identify him. They wouldn't have recognized him. He didn't stand out in a crowd. Well, in any case, without belaboring that point, he goes on to speak as Judas calls him rabbi, teacher, kissing him. Jesus says, friend, why have you come? Now, I've got a little bit of a problem with sarcasm. I say a little problem because that's how I perceive it. Pam perceives it as a bigger problem. And I'm always looking for places in Scripture where Jesus or someone in Scripture that I look up to may have been sarcastic because I'm just looking for some biblical basis to say, I'm, you know, it's biblical. But if there are places, and I do believe there are some, though I doubt it's going to justify my sarcasm. I, I know there are some places where there is sarcasm in Scripture, but here's the thing. Jesus wasn't being sarcastic here. No, this was real. He was being genuine friend. And I believe this was just the, the last opportunity to say, Judas, I know what you're doing. And it, it, it doesn't have to be this way. I love you. I care for you. And even in this moment of betrayal, the Lord's heart is still toward Judas. And that's so important because if Jesus considered Judas a friend who betrayed him, how much more us? I mean, look, we may forsake him and, and falter and fail him. And well, we will. I already mentioned it. They all did. We all do. But Jesus, man, his heart is such that even his enemies, well, he can call them friend. And doesn't he tell us, pray for your enemies, do good to them? Well, you get the picture. He's doing what he tells us to do. For most of us, if we're being honest, while looking back, it won't take very long to find a time when we have done something in our Christian walk that we should be ashamed of. And if we go back a little further before we were Christians to find a time when we flat out rejected Jesus. And that's what makes the truth of this next verse so powerful. Romans 5, 8, and 9 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now what a demonstration of love. To die for a person who refuses to accept or believe in you. To die for a person who, given the chance, would kill you. Now I pray that someday the Lord will perfect that kind of love in me.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.